Well, uh, thank you again for, uh, for joining this session. Uh, we have a great lineup of uh, panel members and speakers, and uh, uh, unfortunately, you've got to listen to me first, but uh, I do appreciate you coming here. Um, uh, the concept of this is to talk a little bit about uh, you know, what we have in terms of process control, and um, the whole idea here is to talk about it's more than just control when you think about it. We've been talking about uh, the interconnection of things, with a lot of discussion about the uh, industrial Internet of Things, but we in this industry have been dealing with connecting things together for a long, long time. And uh, of course, the process control system from my world is the center of attention, but it's a lot more than just control. And um, as we talked a little bit yesterday, uh, what's the driving force behind a process control system and making it more than just control? It's all the business factors. Uh, you have a lot of uh, pressures. It's a, it's a global economy. That's kind of old hat, but the fact of the matter is your competitors are from anywhere in the world. Your enemies are from anywhere in the world when you get right down to it. Um, a lot of pressures to keep your costs down. A lot of pressures to do better than you did last quarter or last year. Um, lowering energy costs is always a factor. Um, There's more and more requirements to have uh, distributed operations. Uh, and I, we, we've been talking about the fact that a lot of the uh, owner operators today have grown by acquisition. And so you have a large mix and match of technologies and all these uh, different cultures as well as technologies have to come together. And of course, uh, my favorite is safety. Safety is extremely important. Whatever you do, it has to operate safely. There's no excuse for not safe, being safe. Um, so that's, that's a primary driving force. And of course, the, uh, the big elephant in the room, as we talked about this morning, is the uh, cybersecurity and, uh, and how uh, cyber has become such an important part of our industry. And, uh, and it's still, we still have vulnerabilities. So. That's a big issue we have to address. So in, in modern business operations, you have your plant. But unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, your plant is not there in isolation. It's really part of an ecosystem. And some of that ecosystem is your own facility. Some of the, uh, we happen to have, by the way, uh, members who, of our panel and speakers today are, happen to be predominantly from the uh, uh, petrochemical oil, oil and gas world. but. It, this applies to any industry who is uh, applying control. Um, but there's an ecosystem. You have your, your raw materials. Uh, in the case of uh, the oil business, it's oil. Um, but it's gas. It's uh, all kinds of materials coming to you from yourself. Maybe you're your own supplier. Maybe you're not. And then, of course, down the other end of the supply chain is your customers and the whole distribution network. And it all has to work together without incident smooth and seamlessly in a collaborative way. This is the message that we at ARC have been talking about for years, is it has to be collaborative. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. So um, unfortunately, there's a lot of control systems that are installed in plants today for, through no fault of their own. They were the best available at the time. But some of those technologies are 20 plus years old. Uh, just a show of hands, how many people in the audience have 20-year-old control systems in their facilities today? Wow. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing. It, that, that's those kind of things. How many of those, how many people have 20-year-old iPhones? Okay. The point is, there's old technology we've got to deal with, and it's got to somehow work with all the new stuff you're bringing in. So some of the systems that are out there are really, they really were not designed for today's modern uh, situations, the new business situations. They're outdated. And, and yet, through a large uh, effect, through you folks, you've managed to keep them operating and keeping them running safely. So you guys deserve a lot of credit for doing that. But it's a lot of hard work. Um, we just feel that there's some room for making uh, a modern control system to be a little easier to work with. 
So uh, a number of years ago now, and it's, it's uh, amazing how time flies, but we came up with this concept we call Collaborative Process Automation System, and we wrote a book. Well, we're now on version three of that book, in which we are outlining um, things that we think a modern control system ought to have. And so we call it the Collaborative Process Automation System. The word collaborative in our, in our definition means People, processes, and technology all work together. So it's surely technology to people. It's also people to technology, but it's also technology to technology. These things ought to just work. So we came up with some guiding principles. Just want to hit a few uh, highlights here. Um, one of them has got to be a collaborative environment, as I said. It, it, these things have to work together. Agility. You know, things change. We've got to be able to keep performance and make changes and keep moving. And when I say changes, they're not just uh, changing the tuning parameters on a control algorithm. It's changes like business changes. Suddenly, the price of crude drops. What, is it, what does that do to you? And how do you respond to it and still make money? Um, you want to be able to have a control and a safety culture. You want to be able to make, maintain that uh, going forward. You want to have as much as possible a common infrastructure. So the common infrastructure means that things just work together. You don't have to go out and write special APIs to get things to work together. But unfortunately, we're still in that world to a large extent. We still have um, things you want to run in your plant that are not, were not developed and delivered by this main supplier of your technology. So you may have to write APIs. You may have to use some... Um, de facto communication method, but we think those things ought to just plug and work securely. And we also have uh, talked about uh, the um, information-driven manufacturing, and we think these things ought to, ought to uh, support that. So what we mean by information-driven manufacturing is there is lots of information in the form it begins in the form of data. And data is not very useful until you put it in the context of what you're trying to achieve. So there's data about uh, your temperatures, pressures, flow, levels, blah, blah, blah. And you've got controls, functions that help to manage that. But you also have information about maintenance, information about asset uh, uh, situations and conditions. And these ought to all work in a collaborative way together. So we call that information-driven manufacturing. And, and we believe that a modern control system, a modern, modern process automation system, ought to support this ability for the information-driven manufacturing. So, so what has changed? What, what is, where, where are we coming from? So I thought this would might be a little instructive, is um, first of all, the focus has definitely moved from the technology. We all use technology, and it's sort of the thing we rely on, and there's no excuse for not being able to do something because the technology is there, but now the focus is on business. So you don't want to, you want to just put technology in for the sake of technology. In fact, if you did want to do that, chances are your management wouldn't let you buy it anyway. So there has to be a business objective, a business goal. In the past, things were very hierarchical structured, and so you know, we had internally some discussions about uh, ISA 95 and how it's a structured uh, layer kind of look. If you look at it from a technical structure, does it really make any sense anymore? What really makes sense if you look at it from a functional structure? There are functions that happen at, at, at the level zero. There's functions that happen at level four. And, and I think ISA 95 is a good way to look at these functions. Cybersecurity. In the past, it was IT's problem. As we heard talking earlier today, is that uh, there's a lot of emphasis. Well, what is cybersecurity? What's the biggest worry? Years ago, not that many years ago, it was loss of intellectual property or maybe uh, credit card theft. Uh, but now, it's how about loss of your plant? How about loss of the ability to produce your products? Or worse than that. So we think cybersecurity ought to not be just a bolt-on. We think it ought to be uh, 
secure by design. These systems ought to be secure by design. You plug things together, it's going to be secure. That's the way we think it should be. Of course, that's easy for me to say. I don't have to build these things. But anyway, uh, data, multiple, uh, multiple copies is the way it has been in the past. And why is that? Because there's multiple technologies and multiple suppliers in your facility. Um, we think it ought to be uh, more uh, single version of the truth. So you have the data as close to the source as possible is one of our principles. And that's what would be the data you rely on, not some copy that was made uh, two months ago. Um, integration, it was a project-based, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, customized integration, which of course is, a, is, is good to get the job running, but then it's a killer going down that 20-year path you're on to maintain those custom integration act, uh, activities. And as you get further and further down that 20-year path, those are harder and harder to maintain. Um, manufacturing operations used to be a totally separate system. You didn't, you didn't even dream about putting that in a control system. We don't agree. We think it's an integral part of a control system. So that's our philosophy. When we look at uh, uh, CPAS, as we, uh, our acronym, we love to build acronyms. Uh, as we look at that, uh, manufacturing operation management is close to the plant, and it has to work in conjunction with the process control. Safety and control used to be totally separate entities. We think there's a need to have them working with each other. Now there's a lot of arguments about whether they are can be the same platform. I, I don't want to get into that. It's really more about safety is as important as, uh, as a control system and they have to work uh, in conjunction with each other. Control and electrical. We had a nice session yesterday about you know some of the uh, opportunities that that presents in terms of saving money for the owner operators here. Uh, not only saving money, making things simpler, uh, making things happen more naturally. <clears throat> engineering design tied to hardware and software. Um, we think engineering design ought to be something that you don't tie it to hardware or the final software until you have to. Let's take advantage of these things like the cloud and virtual uh, reality and uh, simulation. Let's take advantage of those tools and do testing. We heard uh, uh, one of the gentlemen today talking about uh, how the automotive companies today don't really have to do physical crash tests to determine the safety. They can do this all um, through uh, simulation, but regulations make them do crash tests, which is fine. Uh, we don't want crash tests in our industry, but we'd like to be able to be assured that when we simulate things and then we finally bring it to the plant, it's going to work. And then um, solutions, um, services. And I, I must say, I think the, uh, the suppliers in this environment have really stepped up. Uh, years ago, there was very little services you could expect other than services on the product that they sold you. But today, there's all kinds of services available. And so my message is take advantage of those. Let's look at the components of CPAS. And so to begin with, what we see is things like um, very automation-specific hardware. You know, not only controlled by design and built for, you know, built for purpose, but also that uh, security built into them. Uh, we see intelligent I.O., not just the, the I.O. of the past where you had to connect two wires together and, and hope that you got the right transmitter. So um, we think there's a lot of uh, great activities in that area of making uh, smart, intelligent I.O. Uh, visualization. You know, it, it used to be, uh, you know, I had a workstation. That was pretty much what you visualize through. But now there's all kinds of other opportunities to bring in things that are portable, uh, but they all have to be brought in with security. And of course, wireless. You know, we've been connecting things wirelessly for a long time, not necessarily through the World Wide Web, but again, this industry is a very uh, safety and security minded industry, which is a good thing. Uh, but there's a lot of opportunities to take care of the mobile devices that you have, things that move around, um, 
rail cars, uh, trucks, um, things that are not easy to attach wires to, uh, rotating equipment and so forth. Then there's also been a great deal of uh, strides forward in terms of uh, the server technology. It used to be every time you bought an application, you had to buy a server to go with it. And uh, now through server virtualization, uh, that has been become uh, less of an issue. And so that's a great stride forward. Um, taking, uh, taking advantage of the cloud where it makes sense, we see movement of some of the things that we would put in our CPaaS circle, like historians and data for, uh, for use in, uh, in, in uh, looking at historically how you're doing. A lot of that has been available to work in a cl cloud. Maybe it's a private cloud, but nevertheless, it doesn't have to be on the premise as much as it used to. And of course, uh, if I've said safety and security once, I'm going to keep saying it. Very important. That's got to be, uh, you know, utmost in any architecture you put together. And um, and finally, there's the uh, there's the people aspects of this. There's uh, there's uh, all this data that has to be turned into information. Uh, there's great strides in terms of analytics. Uh, we've been talking about analytics now for quite a while, and uh, analytics has been part of this industry for a long time. Uh, it wasn't always called that, but the fact is uh, having smart algorithms is part of that uh, paradigm that lets the operator or the people that need to know what's going on and maybe predicting what's going on, what's going to happen. And of course, ultimately the goal is to have not just knowledge workers, but knowledgeable workers. People who, who know what the business proposition is. Why are they there? They're not just there to adjust temperatures in the plant. So we built this model and we have uh, freshened up the, uh, the, the diagram on the, on the right hand side here to illustrate that it's, a, it's kind of a spherical view where we have business systems above, we have the plant below, and in the middle we have this thing that we call CPAS, which is a collection of all the automation things you need to do, all the instruments and, and measurements and sensors, whether they're hardwired or, or uh, connected uh, through some wireless connection. And of course, all this manufacturing operation management, which is keeping the plant uh, responding to um, the current situation at all times. So um, last year, Sandy Vassar, who's sitting down here, uh, showed me this slide, and I really liked it, because there's another aspect to collaborative automation systems. And this came as a courtesy from uh, Honeywell. And uh, so I like the fact the way it builds. So this is the way uh, projects have typically been done. They're kind of long and linear, and you start at one end, and somewhere along the line, you start to commit to hardware, and you put stuff in there, and, and then down the road, you say, oh, I wish I wouldn't have bought that hardware yet, and I wish I wouldn't have committed to this. Now I've got to go back and redo all that stuff. And uh, uh, this picture says, why don't we change things? Why don't we do, do some more things in a virtual world? Why don't we make uh, late binding decisions? I, I love that term, late binding. We've been using that term in CPAS since we originally wrote the document in 2002. Uh, because don't commit to things until you have to. And, and make, make sure it's working right before you commit. So this is, to me, this is you know, the essence of the project uh, paradigm we're in today. And, and also part of this is don't, uh, don't make people have to do things two or three times. Don't make smart people have to do dumb things just because the system doesn't know how to do those dumb things automatically. I'm sure I'm not doing it as eloquently as, uh, as Sandy did. But uh, So basically, there's a lot of opportunities here that, uh, to make things smarter on the project side. And, uh, you know, designing, using simulation, using the virtual world is... Uh, as much as possible. There's a lot of good technology. It just needs to be applied to the instance of making projects work smoother. And I know a lot of you with those 20-year-old uh, systems and plus, uh, you've got a lot of projects ahead of you. So this is going to be helpful if you can do some of these things. But I want to also give credit to the way um, suppliers have moved. They, they used to be, back when I started, in the lower left-hand corner of this picture. 
They provided you technology and some fundamental services to get it going. That was the world they lived in. And you bought pieces. You know, you, you bought uh, instruments. You didn't necessarily buy systems. Well, as things have progressed, uh, we're up in the upper right-hand corner now where you can buy, uh, you, can, you can get uh, not just the technologies, but you can get applied technologies that fit your, that fit your world, fits, fits what you need. And, and that's our goal in terms of our, our CPAS vi, ver, uh, vision, is we want to be able to have all these things working collaboratively together, your suppliers, yourself, your people, your technologies working together um, so that uh, in a safe and secure environment, control can happen, but it's not the only thing that happens. So that's my, um, that's my message. And the question here is, so this is what it looks like when it's all put together. You know, again, we've got to always go back to some physical picture. It helps, it helps your, your gather. And you see this is a picture we've shown before. Um, a lot of components all working together. Things are simple. Uh, the question is, uh, will the Internet of Things change things? And the, the simple answer to that is absolutely. Uh, it's already starting to change things now. The key thing is, as we were talking about it, it's industrial Internet of Things. And that industrial is a key word. It has to fit for industry. You have to do the risk assessment on whatever you do, whether it's applying an Internet of Thing to, the, or to, your, to your plant or whether it's applying an Internet of Thing to your home. You have to think about the risk. And, uh, but with, with having said that, is it going to be a great thing for us? It already is. It's starting to, it's starting to make its, its way into various industries in an appropriate way. And I have confidence that the people here are going to do it the right way. So with that, I want to thank you for listening to me.